Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to share some images of a project that I and my collaborators are working with. And it's a rather ambitious project. It's founded right here at Waterloo Architecture. And I'm working with colleagues like Rob Gorbett from Knowledge Integration, Rachel Armstrong, other institutions, and wonderful studio mates, Haley Isaacs, Jonathan Terrell, Eric Burry, and a lot of other collaborators. And we are trying to make a project of living architecture. Life is a pretty big word. And so maybe I'm being rather presumptuous when I say that. I'm sure I'm being presumptuous. If I was saying that 50 years ago, then perhaps I'd be talking about the symbolism of architecture and sculpture. I mean, after all, sculpture has been working symbolically to emulate life for thousands of years. Think of the myth of Pygmalion, the Greek sculptor who tries to impart life into the sculpture such that it breathes and comes alive. Perhaps buildings are like that as well. But I think that things have changed. I think that it's possible to no longer only work symbolically about hoping that things can come alive. When I think of the kind of project, the progress that is, of work like the Genome Project, that is of achieving the kind of information set for the organization of nature and of the reproduction sets of cells so that we can understand how our own physiology is created. When I think of the parallel progress, in things like artificial intelligence, where we can build software that can learn and that can find its own kind of balance in the world. When I think of innumerable parallel paths to that in physics, in chemistry, in the new sciences of smart materials, then I think that I can speak about the project of creating life in a rather different way. I think increasingly we're justified in speaking about creating life. And I hope that I can convince you that I'm justified by showing some of the faltering starting steps in this project. Now, in the kind of image that you see here, perhaps we can see one kind of ideal architecture. Let's take this circle as an ideal building. This might relate to a long tradition of trying to make forms that are optimum for buildings. And this particular form, this circle or sphere, might be one kind of architecture. I'd like to think so. This kind of architecture would say that energy is important and that boundary is important and that we need to know where we stand. And there's a curious kind of math and arithmetic that's embedded in this kind of thing as well. Because a sphere or a circle is a kind of arithmetic that, that, that says that I have the most possible territory inside and the least possible envelope needed to make it. It's a very curious kind of thing because it might seem like an ideal, but it's actually a kind of machine for resisting interaction, for having the minimum possible exposing face, vulnerability, interaction with the environment. And I'd like to talk about a rather different kind of form, such as this diffusive form, the kind of deeply reticulated, involved, convoluted, hovering involvement in the world. And I'll show you what I mean by showing the projects that are based on this kind of form language as an opposition. The projects that I'm going to show might be similar to this one, the Hylozoic Ground Project, which was just mounted at the Venice Biennale, a deeply diffusive cloud of material that we participate in by walking through it. And it breathes around us in very, very gentle ways. Now, this kind of responsive living, ar living architecture does not have a kind of military agenda of making you more powerful or pushing a button and having major tools expand out. Instead, small incremental motions, tiny breathing, gentle ripples emanate out in order to create a kind of presence that works with us. Riddled throughout that kind of environment also is a, is a metabolism. Many, many incubators of small little bits of prototype cells, protocells that have a, an artificial metabolism that processes the environment as well, trickling through, taking carbon and translating it into harb harmless carbonate. A kind of generous, simple metabolism that starts to process itself. When you walk through this environment, you'll see many layers, such as the very, very lightweight filters that you can see stretching through this environment, reaching behind me. It's organized as overall meshworks and filters and hanging clusters 
that work all together, work interactively to process the environment. And if you push this all together and compress it, perhaps you could see a roof of the future made of many, many breathing pores, or perhaps would turn it sideways and make a, a breathing wall. There's also some social spaces in this architecture. It's not just about mechanisms. You'll see, for example, a small cluster just coming up on the screen right now where people gather and where small contributions and small, small conversations happen. This then is the start of a public architecture, a public architecture that's rooted in individuals. And this is not the kind of confident motion of, of, of people gathering in Tiananmen Square or the Washington Mall at proud choruses. Rather, it's the growing, clustering, village-like be be beginnings of a really resilient public architecture that moves quite beyond the boundaries, the closed boundaries of that kind of sphere or square or, har or hardened wall architecture and instead, instead reaches out like snowflakes, like perhaps sea urchins or the, the myriad of forms that diffuse out and seek interaction. And the hope then of this project, that I'll show some, show some more details in a minute, is to achieve a kind of mutual relationship with many sensitive boundaries involved in the world. Now let me share some practical strategies for achieving this. This kind of image shows that there are multiple thermal boundaries around each of our bodies. Perhaps we could think of ourselves as little thermal pumps where convective loops of, of, of air can, can, can pass over our bodies. That kind of energy can be harvested and worked together in, into next generation energy exchanges in buildings. Plasma, water, air can also be understood as structured mediums. This is a beautiful image of a cytoplasm in a cell by Donald Ingber, which shows that proteins can be organized into geodesic frameworks, structured media. If we think of the kind of example of an amoeba, then we could think of the chemical interactions as outside that body as pulling it around every bit as much as the amoeba working to have a kind of agenda, working and steering itself. So the push and pull of chemicals outside and inside an environment are tremendously significant. And you can see that at practical work in this loop, film loop now, where Rachel Armstrong and I are generating automatically forming skins. There's a copper felt which deposits, its, deposits on this copper sulfate crystal, and it generates this rather messy self-generating skin. We've got this working in the open air as well in, this, in the form of these strands, and we're hoping that we can use these to clothe scaffolds in order to make self-generating skins for buildings. You could think of this as a rather gentle, perhaps messy, automatic uh, uh, skin system for buildings. I'm going to show you some religious paintings to, tr to try to amplify some of the ethics as well. Here's a, a, an image of St. Francis by Bellini, which speaks about an openness, a gathering in, an interest in the, in the environment. In this painting by Grunewald, there's an extraordinary kind of rendering of not only the skin, but also the textile rippling around the forms of the hands, amplifying the emotion in the, in the painting. And that sense of being involved in the atmosphere is even more extraordinary in Roger van der Weyden's picture here, in which the walls also are weeping, the sense of mineral efflorescence, an extraordinary kind of response and involvement. I love this kind of constructed light, the aura that sits in this image by Nero de Bici, the beautiful Florentine, neo-Byzantine painter. And this sense then that boundaries exist around each of us that are sensitive and that can be constructed might give us a kind of an impulse for this architecture. So I'll just show you a few projects now, a couple of projects, such as, such as this one, endothelium which tries to work with these principles. Endothelium is a geotextile, a kind of a reinforced scaffolding of Earth, which has its own power system, little bits of power made, made of organic bladders of, of, uh, of, of vinegar and copper and aluminum that then generate little vibrations using cell phone vib vibrators that are fitted to feet, barbed feet, that slowly shiver and dig into the earth, making a, a whole kind of earth surface machine over the months that the, this, uh, this installation is in place. It slowly dies over, over, over the life of the environment. It's a rather sad kind, kind of sculpture. Here you can see some more progress in recent works where the metabolism is studied all the way through using cloud-like diffusive elements. This is made mostly by digital fabrication in the studio. Many, many individual elements which are drawn and then spun together in, into these, these weather-like webs. And when you go into this kind of environment then, which is organized with the overall meshworks, 
the chemical metabolisms and the, and the mechanisms that I've just described, at first the image and the experience is very, very quiet. You walk in to a grove. You're underneath a canopy. You're in a thicket, kind of primary architecture. But then as you come closer to some of the elements, proximity sensors that are studied all the way through the environment, arrays of proximity sensors track your motion and send out signals back to a mesh, to a mesh of microprocessors. There are dozens and dozens of microprocessors arranged in a village-like form. And they send out small ripples of response. And so the first image is one of a pebble in a pond, of sending ripples out back through, and a kind of breathing, quiet response moves. That becomes a bit more turbulent when there are more people in the, in the room, like multiple pebbles in, in, in ponds. And then things can get very crowded indeed when there's, when there's a large crowd. This kind of environment works by using very specific mechanisms, rather gentle mechanisms, shape memory alloys, for example. I've got an example right here. And these kind of mechanisms, rather than powerful motors and gears, use by work, work by contraction. A little bit of current makes this contract, and then this is amplified, and then individual elements will be made to, to, to contract and, and, and move. And those are multiplied by the hundreds and hundreds, and then work within a meshwork where, where, where there are many hundreds of thousands of components in order to make the overall immersive environment of, the, of, this, element, of, of, of this work. You can see some images behind me of the chemical metabolism and some of the, of the mechanisms working as well. And you can s imagine that all of these chain together into a kind of chorus, not the kind of powerful unified uh, res response of one single machine, but rather the kind of intelligence of a swarm, of a whole festival of many, many little acts. Let me emphasize one of the structures that's in it, that is the hyperbolic meshworks that is individual chevrons, V-shaped forms, which we've designed to, to snap, snap together into tetrahedral shapes. And then they multiply together into a very large uh, kind of meshwork, which is very flexible as well as able to span. It's extremely efficient. It deeply nests together when it's manufactured, but then it expands out a thousandfold in, into an extraordinary efficiency in the space. And this kind of textile, which is a fundamental kind of architectural material, then is flexible enough to take mechanisms in it so that it can flex and breathe, and also can be formed into a very flexible topology, which makes arcs, for example, and vaults, and, and, and canopies, and columns. And then that can accept the relatively gentle, small mechanisms which are organized all the way through it. The mechanisms are chained together and they make waves of, of, of motion so that the entire environment can start to work with you. Now the drawings that I'm showing now in, in, in this film perhaps explain some of the individual elements such as the columns that you can see and the canopies behind, some swallowing elements and suspended filters and cricket fields, acoustic resonators as well, that move and respond back to us. Each one of those systems has its own interactive computing uh, worked into it. Very, very simple Arduino or open source com computing, which then is chained together in domino chains so that one impulse will be passed to its neighbor and passed to its neighbor and passed to its neighbor again, and then organized into a great tribal layered amalgam by putting those things together as well and passing global signals and al allowing global, si glo global behavior to, to emerge. The organization of the individual clusters has proximity sensors linked to the computers and then linked back to chains of mechanisms. And you can see how these chains of, mo of motion re re result, pumping, gently trickling the air through the system and working as a huge lung that does our breathing for us. And then this works then as a great kind of very diffuse canopy system that shelters us and gathers us as a fundamental kind of near living architecture. The hope then is that this can work not as a solid boundary, but something that is open and that can increasingly become more robust as we engineer it and ready it for, for application in the public. Here we can see the meshwork itself unclothed, and then the next image you'll see it clothed with a deep, fissured, viscous number of bladders and glands and traps that impart humidity and that foster the chemical exchanges of, of, of the environment. For example, they have salts in them that work hygroscopically, meaning it pulls fluids into them. 
Here you can see the incubator nests of the protocells, the prototype cells, each one of which is housed in a little cluster of filters that passes air through it and gently tempers it. Lights, quite powerful lights, give bursts of energy, which, and those, those bursts are fostered by your own interactions. You come up to it, that the, the, the sense, senses are, are collected, and then that, that gives the in, individual in, in incubators their, their impulse. And so you're very much involved in the growth and the regulation of the entire system. The design ethic that's behind this is not one of power. Instead, it's one of trying to make things as potent as possible by taking things right to the edge of their ability to span so that things tremble, so that things can be deliberately fragile and potent. This might have a kind of relation to homeopathy, that is, the, the notional medicine of stretching and of making things more reactive rather than thinking, thinking that things can be more powerful by concentrating them. It's quite an emotional architecture as well, as, 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 as you might imagine, where joints and, and fittings have a kind of an agenda of clutching and poking and desiring and pulling, a kind of an exchange with us. So what kind of relationship does this near-living architecture offer? Well, I hope I've offered a number of practical strategies of speaking about thermal boundaries, of working very directly with the environment, of working with next-generation chemistries which allow designers to directly participate in making fluid, subtle, kind of materials that can wrap around us and expand our influence. Next generation structures have a tremendous amount to, to do with this. That is, structures that can work and be renewed and perhaps be housed in, in, in this kind of sense of an expanded possibility of constructing light itself. And I hope that this set of strategies then might be a contribution to some possibilities that justify the optimism in creating living things in the future. Thank you.